Good afternoon. My name is Mecit Öztop. I'm from Middle East Technical University, Turkey. My talk is not going to be about nutrition management or health. In fact, it's more a chemi chemical-based approach that I'm going to talk about today, which, as you can see from the title, monitoring acid catalyzed hydrolysis of sucrose through low-resolution NMR laxometry. Well, first of all, I want to make an introduction of we talk about NMR laxometry or MRI, and we usually study these terms for the foods, and how are we using MRI in foods? Well, we have just published a review on the applications of magnetic resonance imaging on foods, which also gives a basic introduction about the fundamentals of MRI, or acquiring an NMR signal. Well, let's go over some of this basic information. What happens or how we can acquire a signal and then how we process the signal to obtain any information for foods. Whenever you put a food sample into a magnet, the protons align with the magnetic field and then they start to spin at a frequency which is proportional to the magnetic field strength of the magnet. And then you apply an RF pulse. Once you turn off the RF pulse, you apply this, you obtain the signal. And based on the signal decay or the recovery, you obtain either a relaxation or recovery signal. And this relaxation and recovery signal are usually associated with the microstructure of the sample that you are dealing with. And in the case of an imaging, these signals are further processed to obtain the voxels in an image. But for the relaxometry, we just utilize this decaying or recovery signal to obtain information about the sample. And what an MR relaxometry means is whenever we have this decaying signal, we apply a mathematical transformation, which is in fact inverse Laplace transform, to obtain a spectrum which is called relaxation spectrum. And depending on whether it is T2 or T1, it's called T2 relaxation spectrum or T1 relaxation spectrum. And what we have concentrated is utilizing the information that we obtain from a T2 relaxation spectrum. Well, what has been done in the literature regarding the utilization of these spectrums? Well, we have investigated the controlled release behavior in whey protein gels and tried to use these systems to obtain information about what is going on in the hydrogels as swelling occurs in the system. Or another important uh, po uh, research which we have used was understanding the disintegration in cellular microstructure. Whenever you apply high pressure processing or pulse electric field to a plant tissue, what happens is the cells could be affected adversely. In order to understand the effect of degree of the process, we can acquire an NMR signal and look at the spectrum to see the degree of deformation or degree of disintegration on the cell. And for instance, what we have done was uh, as disintegration efficiency of the pulse electric field on onion tissue, so PEP was applied on the onion tissue, and as a result, the cell structure was uh, observed through an MR relaxation spectrum, or what we have done was looking at the cell structure by a two-dimensional approach on mango slices, which have been subjected to freeze-thawing process that were, uh, that were exposed to pectin methyl and uh, esterase infusion. It's also possible to look at the diffusion behavior by looking at MR images or NMR signal. And we try to understand, for instance, what is happening in the case of white rice or brown rice when gastric juice diffuses into these grains. Well, how are we obtaining these data? There are a bunch of different approaches. Whenever you first think about an MRI, you will first think that, OK, the one that you see that three Tesla, the clinical MR scanners. Well, this is not the one that we are using, in fact. There's one Tesla options, which are still not very cheap, 
but there are the lower resolutions ones which are affordable and can be utilized in very classical type laboratory experiments. And the one that we have used was the 0.5 Tesla system, which has a very small probe, but it is enough to obtain this, to, uh, acquire, uh, to perform these relaxation experiments. Well, in fact, the aim of this talk is, okay, looking at how we can investigate the chemical reactions by using this technique. Normally, how are we monitoring chemical reactions? UV, IR, or Raman spectroscopy, which are advanced spectroscopic techniques, could be used to understand the degree of a chemical reaction or which products are being formed or the, to calculate the yield of a reaction. And, but the thing is, for instance, to obtain iso the structural isomer information, more detailed approaches required and usually NMR spectroscopy is used for that purpose. But for an, and in that regard, online NMR is a very powerful technique for monitoring reaction progression as well as providing mechanistic insight into the synthesis. Well, what type of NMR experiments are we talking about when we say NMR spectroscopy? Well, here you see a big 800 megahertz system, or there could be 400 megahertz systems, which usually the chemists use for spectroscopy purposes. And on the right, you see the red one, which is a one Tesla instrument that could also be used to conduct NMR spectroscopy experiments. Well, in the food science, for how are these, how is NMR spectroscopy used to obtain information about the reaction? Here, we, there is an example about a fer monitoring a fermentation process via non-invasive low field NMR. But here what is being done is this complex scenario of obtaining the spectrum, applying Fourier transform, then using the chemical shifts and obtaining the chemical information. Or, for instance, in that case, there's another study which they have looked at the hydrolysis of acetic anhydride, again by using the spectroscopical information where they obtain the reaction rate constant and later on the Arrhenius parameters. And here you see how this small one Tesla NMR spectrometer has been used for a reaction monitoring system where the, there's a flow system and a continuous data could be acquired. Well, but what we are really interested in is, okay, I said that we have low resolution NMRs or what we can, or the, so we call the medium resolution NMRs, which are like 0.5 to 0 0.32, 0.3 Tesla. How, what can we do in terms of the reaction by using these? There's uh, another study where they have used, for instance, the senescence in leaves through NMR relaxometry, and they have used these spectrums to see what is going on the subcellular level to the structure and obtain an information about the degree of senescence. But in terms of chemical reactions, this NMR relaxometry is also being used. Especially in the energy literature, this new technique is being common, and the biodiesel formation through transesterification reactions, monitoring by low resolution NMR relaxometry is becoming possible. And here you can see again some spectrums that shows that we can, for instance, obtain information about the glycerol formation or the fatty acid methyl ester formation as a result of the reaction by looking at the spectrum as I have shown you in the beginning. Or another example, transesterification reaction using biodiesel production, again with a very low resolution NMR system, so the biodiesel yield could be obtained just by looking at the T2 values. What we did? Well, we in fact did a very basic reaction, a food reaction, it is the sucrose hydrolysis reaction where we use an acid catalyst and it's basically hydrochloric acid and we know that sucrose is a disaccharide that contains glucose and fructose and it has been decomposed to its monomers as the pH is decreased. So, and the resulting mixture as most of us know is known as the inward sugar. So what we aimed to do is, okay, can we identify the degree of this reaction, in other words, the yield, for instance, of that reaction by looking at this spectrum, okay? 
end. So the NMR system that we have is shown here. And these reactions have been performed at different sucrose concentrations, including 10, 15, 30 percent, and at different temperatures. Okay? And we obtained the reducing sugar content by the DNS method for these six different conditions. And later on, looked at how these reducing sugar contents are correlated with the relaxation times that we measured through this NMR experiments. And for instance, here it shows you a T2 decay curve for the sucrose solution. On the left, you, we have a fitting that is based on the mono exponential fitting. On the right, you see a B exponential fitting. But, and in this slide, you see the relaxation spectrum. And as you see, we have now two peaks that is denoting this sucrose solution during the reaction. And we have peak one, peak two, and the relative areas of these peaks, which can be used to be correlated with the reducing sugar content. And in fact, this is my last slide. What we have done is for different concentrations, 10, 15, 30, and 20 percent, and different temperatures, we got the T2 mono exponential values, B exponential values, the peak relaxation times, and tried to perform Pearson correlation and obtain the Pearson correlation values between the reducing sugar content and the T2 values. And it looked like that the second component in the relaxation spectrum showed a higher correlation value with respect to reducing sugar content for all temperatures and for all concentrations. And what's the take home message of this? It's definitely true that sucrose in solution is expressed as two compartments in a T2 relaxation spectrum. Longer T2 compartment is well correlated at different temperatures and concentrations during hydrolysis. And this is mostly associated with hydroxyl groups in the solution that is coming from fructose and uh, glucose. However, to obtain more concrete solutions, fructose and glucose individual relaxation times should be examined. And it is definitely true that in consistent with the literature that is available based on the biodiesel, so NMRT2 relaxometry has the potential to be used as a reaction monitoring tool, as an alternative to spectroscopic experiments, which are usually based on a very expensive instrument. So for this specific study, to really obtain good conclusions, a wider concentration range can be, uh, would be tried to obtain more concrete results. That's it. Thank you very much for listening.